Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Diana Lee, Senior Content Development Specialist of Public Programs for the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia University. And I would like to welcome everyone to this evening's Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture. The Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture offers lectures in a series featuring world-class scientists and experts, and they address issues of societal importance to inform and engage our community. In conjunction with this lecture series, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation Teacher Scholar Program provides support to local science teachers who bring this content into their classrooms. And I'm really, really happy that we're able to welcome the teachers finally back in person to view these lectures this year. And I'm also really, really thrilled because there's so many of you tuning in online today. And I wanna thank you for taking time out of your day to join us here tonight as we continue to share our commitment to outstanding science and excellent programming. We hope that tonight's presentation will invite you to explore the science happening at the Zuckerman Institute at Columbia University and beyond. And think about the way that science shows up in our daily lives. We have a really exciting topic in store for you tonight, and we're gonna explore how the brain learns to communicate in a very social world. I would like to thank the Stavros Narcos Foundation and the foundation members who join us here tonight for their continued partnership and commitment to help make brain science accessible to the public. This has never been more important until than it is now. Tonight, you will be treated to presentations from two incredible speakers, followed by a conversation led by Columbia University's Dr. Raphael Millier. Raphael is the 2020 Robert A. Bird Presidential Scholar in Society and Neuroscience at Columbia University. He is a philosopher interested in the philosophy of mind, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence. He received his PhD in 2020 from the University of Oxford, where he worked on self-consciousness. His current research focuses mainly on gaining a better understanding of the capacities and limitations of recent AI algorithms, and to establish meaningful and fair comparisons between these algorithms and human cognition. In addition, he is interested in the social impact and potential harms of the increasingly pervasive deployment of these algorithms in platforms and products used by the general public. Before I turn this event over to Raphael to introduce tonight's incredible speakers, I want to thank those of you who already submitted questions in advance and just want to emphasize that what makes our events really dynamic and super exciting is when we're able to address your questions. So tonight, Raphael will alternate between questions from online and in-person attendees. If you're watching online, I really encourage you all to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions during the lectures. And if you're attending in person, I would ask you to raise your hand after the lectures during the Q&A portion, and you'll receive a handheld mic to ask your questions. So please give me a very warm welcome in person and online to our host and moderator, Dr. Raphael Millier. Thank you, Diana, for this kind introduction. It's my pleasure to introduce this event. In today's event, we will be hearing from Dr. Vikram Garaga and Dr. Karen Froud, two experts who study how the brain learns something as intricate as understanding and producing language. Taking different but complementary approaches to this topic, our speakers will discuss the neuroscience of language in a world where so much depends on social communication. As someone who research straddles the line between philosophy and cognitive science, I have had a long-standing interest in language. In my recent work, I have been studying artificial intelligence algorithms that can learn to generate text as fluently as humans. These algorithms raise fascinating questions about the nature of language acquisition, understanding, and communication, not only in artificial systems, but also in humans and non-human animals. I am particularly excited in hearing from our two speakers about how their own work can enrich our understanding of these issues. In this event, we will hear two 15-minute talk, one from each speaker, after which I will moderate a discussion in which we will include questions from you, our audience. 
If you already have submitted a question, thank you. If you wish to submit a question while the talks are in progress, please look for the Q&A button to submit your questions to the panelists. And please let us know if you are a teacher or a student. If you are a student, please also tell us which grade you're in. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Vikram Gadakar, who is a neuroscientist studying the neural mechanisms underlying social behavior and communication in songbirds to better understand how our brains can practice, evaluate, and perform complex skills. He is a assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience, Columbia University, and he is a principal investigator at the Mortimer B. Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute at Columbia University. Vikram received his BS in physics, chemistry, and mathematics from Bangalore University, his MS in physics from the Indian Institute of Science, and his PhD in physics from Cornell University. He then received his postdoctoral training at Cornell University. Vikram is a 2021 Searle Scholar and a recipient of the Peter and Patricia Gruber International Research Award, the NIH Chi-99R00 Pathway to Independence Award, and the Simons Collaboration on the Global Brain Postdoctoral Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Vikram to the stage. <coughs> Good evening. Everybody can hear me great. Thank you so much for that introduction. A big thank you to the Stavros Nyakos Foundation and thank you everybody for, uh, for showing up tonight. So since we're all gathered in New York, I thought I would begin with a New York story. The great pianist Arthur Rubinstein was walking along the streets of New York one day when a pedestrian approached him and asked him, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? Rubinstein pondered this for a second and said, practice. <laughs> so indeed, many of our behaviors are not innately programmed, but are acquired through a process of trial and error or practice. We all know that learning to play tennis or learning to play the piano can take years and sometimes a lifetime of practice. Much of our understanding of the neural mechanisms underlying trial and error learning comes from the study of animals engaged in various tasks motivated by primary rewards like food or juice. Put a rat in a box with a lever, and he will learn by trial and error to press the lever for a food reward. Classic experiments in the 1950s by Olds and Milner showed that we can remove food from the equation if we hook up the lever to an electrode with which the rat can self-stimulate his dopamine neurons. If you do this, the rat will learn to press the lever not for food, but for a squirt of dopamine. Now, you must all be familiar with the addictive properties of dopamine, but dopaminergic signals in the brain are also ideally suited for trial and error learning. These data show the response of a dopamine neuron of a monkey that has been trained to associate a light cue with a juice reward one second later. Time is on the x-axis. Each dot here is an action potential or the firing of this dopamine neuron. Each row is a trial, and what is shown on top is the firing rate histogram. So since the light is presented at random, and since the light predicts a juice reward, the appearance of the light is a better than expected outcome or what we call a positive prediction error and is signaled by this phasic increase in dopamine. Now, one second later, when the monkey is expecting to get juice, if that juice is withheld, that would constitute a worse than expected outcome or what we call a negative prediction error and is signaled by a decrease in dopamine. These phasic increases and decreases are thought to positively and negatively reinforce preceding motor acts, thus leading to learning. So in other words, if dopamine goes up, that's telling the rest of the brain, whatever you did just now was great, do that again. And if dopamine goes down, that's telling the rest of the brain, whatever just happened was not so great, don't do that again. The principle of dopaminergic reward prediction error, as this is called, has been highly influential in neuroscience. However, most of our motor skills, like speaking or playing a musical instrument, are not learned in the pursuit of immediate food or juice rewards. Instead, they are learned by comparing ongoing performance to an internal goal. Imagine, for example, that you're learning to play an eight time step song on the piano. And you want to play C sharp at time step three and F sharp at time step six. Now, while you're practicing this piece, if you happen to play C sharp at time step six, 
your brain immediately recognizes this as an error or a mistake. The point here is that there's nothing intrinsically good or bad about the sound of C sharp. It is simply that you wanted to hear it at time step three, but did not want to hear it at time step six. So the question I was interested in is how are such internally guided motor sequences evaluated by the brain? For this, we turn to the zebra finch. So first of all, zebra finch songbirds don't learn to sing their songs for food or juice rewards. The adult zebra finch song is a naturally learned, highly stereotyped motor sequence. Here is a spectrogram of the zebra finch song. Time is on the x-axis, frequency is on the y-axis, and the color represents spectral power. And as you can see, the song consists of distinct syllables, A, B, C, D, and so on, that the bird repeats again and again and again. So let me see if I can play this for you. There we go. Okay, so you hear that the, the repetitions. Now, too much. Okay, so now a baby finch is not born being able to sing like this. So just like a human infant, all a baby finch can do is babble, and this is what babbling sounds like. The father. <laughs> The, the father finch, yeah, not very pretty. The, the, the father finch sings to the baby finch. The baby finch remembers the father finch's song and then spends like the, the next two months trying to make a copy of his father's song through a process that looks very similar to trial and error learning or practice. Here's a video of a father finch tutoring his son. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so if zebra so if zebra finches are learning their song by trial and error, now the question becomes where is the error signal? Where is the error signal in the brain for song learning? Sorry. So for that, we turn to the brain. Now, as we know, behavior is largely driven by circuits in the brain, by neural circuits. And much of our understanding of the brain circuits involved in reward-based trial and error learning comes from the study of these basal ganglia thalamocortical loops in the brain. Now, it turns out that mammals and songbirds have very similar brain circuits, and songbirds also have these basal ganglia thalamocortical loops in their brains. Indeed, the zebra finch brain contains a discrete set of interconnected brain regions called the song system that's dedicated to singing, including a dopaminergic projection from this nucleus called VTA, which projects to area X, which is the singing-related basal ganglia. So inspired by the mammalian literature on external reward prediction errors, we and others hypothesized that perhaps dopamine neurons in VTA might convey a conceptually similar error signal for song learning even though song is internally evaluated. So to test this hypothesis, I recorded from dopamine neurons in VTA while the birds were singing and while I fooled the birds into thinking they made a mistake. And the way I did this was I selectively distorted 50% of the renditions of a particular target syllable with auditory feedback to ensure that the feedback sound sounded similar to normal zebra fin song I took a 50 millisecond snippet from a different syllable and played it over the target syllable. So what do I mean by this? So let's say the bird song has four syllables, A, B, C, D, which sounds like chikwa, eh? and I take the first part of syllable A, which sounds like ch, and play it over syllable D. So the bird is singing along chikwa, eh, chikwa, eh, chikwa, eh, chikwa, eh, but what he hears is chikwa, eh, chikwa, eh, chikwa, ch, chikwa, ch, chikwa, eh, chikwa, ch, chikwa, ch, chikwa, eh, chikwa, eh, depending on whether or not syllable D was distorted with feedback. The idea is that a distorted syllable should sound wrong to the bird, should sound worse than expected, and should cause these negative prediction error signals. Okay, so let's find out if that is what happens. So here is the first neuron 
that I recorded during this paradigm. And let's look at the distorted trials first. So here we have the distorted spectrogram. You can see the different syllables, A, B, C, D, and so on. And you can see that syllable D has been distorted with feedback. Below that is the example neural trace. Each line here is an action potential. And the yellow box represents the time during which the feedback was presented. Below that, we have a raster plot and a firing rate histogram. Again, each line here is an action potential. Each row is a trial. Looking at these plots, you can tell that this neuron shows a distinct suppression in firing rate, or in other words, it's turned off immediately after feedback on every single trial. This is exactly the kind of signal that we were looking for, and this is consistent with that syllable sounding wrong. Now, what about the undistorted trials when we did nothing to the syllable? Once again, we have the spectrogram and the example neural trace, and you can see here that syllable D in this case has been left completely untouched. Looking at the corresponding raster plot and the firing rate histogram, you can see now that the same neuron shows an increase in firing rate at the precise time point in the song when a distortion might have occurred but did not. This is consistent with the syllable sounding right. Now, I have plotted the same data in a slightly different way, so it makes it easier for you to see what I'm talking about. So once again, we have the undistorted and distorted spectrograms, example neural traces, raster plots, and firing rate histograms. If you focus your attention on the firing rate histograms, you can see that the firing rate of this neuron is nearly identical at all time points in the song, except immediately after feedback, when there is a significant suppression after distorted syllables and a significant activation after undistorted syllables. Now, these distortions are easy to understand, right? I distort the syllable, it sounds wrong, it sounds worse than expected, so dopamine goes down. But why is there an activation when I do nothing at all to the syllable? Our interpretation is that because we were distorting syllable D half the time, the expected quality of syllable D was actually lowered for the bird. So the bird almost expected it to be not so good. And so when it heard a completely untouched syllable D, it actually sounded better than expected. And that is what is signaled by this increase in dopamine. So once again, we have a better than expected and worse than expected dopamine signal, but in this, but here for performance outcomes as opposed to rewards. So whether your performance is better than you expect it to be or worse than you expect it to be. And so we call these error signals performance prediction error signals. So everything I've talked to you so far is about practice. Now the bird is practicing his song to learn his song. But the reason we often practice something is so we can perform in front of an audience. Right? And, we, and we all know that practice is often associated with exploration and variability that we harness for learning, whereas performance is characterized by exploitation and stereotypy of learned behavior. Now, I, was, I had a bunch of musician friends and I was telling them about these results and they claimed that they treated mistakes differently whether they were practicing or performing. When they were practicing, if they made a mistake, they paid a lot of attention to their mistake because they wanna learn from it. But if they were performing in front of a big audience and it was the big day, and then they happened to make a similar mistake, they might want to brush it under the carpet because you know the show must go on. So this led me to wonder, can the brain actually handle errors or mistakes differently depending on whether it's in a practice mode or a performance mode? And it turns out that zebra finches are actually the perfect system to ask this question because male zebra finches practice their songs alone with the ultimate goal of performing to a female. It's a courtship song after all. And in fact, singing alone produces a slightly more variable song like you would expect for practice compared to singing to a female, which we call female directed song, which is much more stereotyped or less variable. Okay, so here's a video of a male that's gonna to sing to a female. So this is a male, a female is gonna appear and he's gonna immediately start singing to her. <laughs> Where did you go? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the question now is what happens to this dopamine error signal that we saw during practice when they're actually performing to the female? 
So to answer this, I did the same kind of experiment, but now I recorded from these neurons first when the males were by themselves, and then when they performed to a female. So here is one neuron that I recorded during this paradigm. So first, when they were alone, you see that we have a very similar error signal just like before. There's a suppression after distorted syllables and an activation after undistorted syllables. But when they start performing to the female, you can see that this error signal that was present during practice is now reduced. And in many neurons, it was completely turned off. So these results suggest that the brain might indeed handle motor errors differently during practice and performance, and is one of the first demonstrations that dopaminergic error signals can be modulated by social context. So the big picture, the big picture, the, the take home message really is that satisfying internal goals in the pursuit of learning seems to activate the same reward systems that have been so extensively studied in neuroscience. So the next time that you're really thirsty and somebody unexpectedly gives you some juice, the circuits in your brain that are activated might be the same circuits that are activated when you unexpectedly hit the right note when you're practicing on the piano. So let's say the next time you're practicing your eight time step song on the piano and you happen to do a better than expected job at time step three and a worse than expected job at time step six, there is perhaps a dopaminergic projection to your basal ganglia that looks like that an increase at time step three and a decrease at time step six. But now you practice this piece so well that you become an expert and you decide to perform it to your friends and then you make similar mistakes. Maybe your self-evaluation system is turned down and your dopamine signal looks like that. So the big question for tonight is, what can songbirds tell us about human language? So everything that I've told you about practice and performance and how songbirds learn to sing, can we gain any insights from that about how humans learn to speak? And I think for that, we're gonna to turn to Karen and see what she thinks about this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vikram. Remember, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button and we will try and answer them in the Q&A after the talk. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Karen Proud, who is a theoretical linguist and neuroscientist studying how the human brain represents, that's better, processes <laughs> and produces speech, especially in the context of developmental and acquired language disorders. She is a professor of neuroscience and education in the Department of Biobehavioral Sciences at Teachers College, Columbia University. Originally trained in the UK as a speech language pathologist, where she worked with adults who have severe neurological disabilities. Karen's doctoral and postdoctoral work was conducted at University College London and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She now directs the Neurocognition of Language Lab where she and her team conduct brain imaging experiments to investigate questions about the neuroscience of language, learning, and cognitive processing across the lifespan, with an emphasis on multilingualism, literacy, and speech language impairments. Please join me in welcoming Karen to the stage. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Raphael, for that very nice introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, so I'm very happy to be with you all this evening and, um, and to be in person. Um, I want to build on these concepts of practice and performance that Vikram outlined so beautifully and try to relate them to some of the work I've been doing in human communication, specifically how we process speech and language, both in auditory and written forms. Now, because I deal with humans, we can't put electrodes in people's brains and measure their dopamine responses. Um, but we do have some other very fun and interesting ways of trying to uh, do this work. Now, I only have a very short time with you, but I'm going to try and pack in a lot. I'll talk about the importance of practice for speech and what might happen when practice goes wrong and some other skills that rely on language, especially reading and how important practice is in those skills too. And then I'll talk about how differences in the mode and the timing of that practice can alter the outcomes in these complex domains. Hopefully all of that then will make sense with respect to the neuroscience research that we've been doing in my lab. So let's get started with some speech development examples. So we all know that acquiring language requires a lot of practice. And we've heard of things like the babble stage, the single word stage, and so on. So I want to play you some really beautiful data that I think exemplify this just so well. 
It's actually from the archives of MIT researcher, Dr. Deb Roy, um, who undertook this extraordinary feat of recording his home environment 24 seven for the first three years of his child's life. Now, not everybody would do this naturally. <laughs> Uh, but it gave us access to some incredible data about the kinds of practice that children go through in order to acquire even a single word. So here are the recordings of his baby son's utterances of the word water. And you can literally hear the word emerging. These sound clips were pulled across the entire three years of the data set. great but you you know what you were all doing like rooting for him to get it and it, it's I've heard it so many times and it still gets me that way too and the the really interesting thing about it is that it gives you so many insights into how we as caregivers actually structure that linguistic environment and support that kind of outcome for the learner um, so Dr. Roy um, presented those data in his talk in 2011 and gave us a lot of insights about the linguistic environment too. But as you heard, the interesting thing for our purposes right now is that those utterances started off a little bit sort of shapeless and general, right? Syllables that could be applied to many different kinds of things and then gradually became more and more specific and more highly specified with practice until the word was really unambiguous. It's really a remarkable process. And so many of us have been trying to understand what it is that might be happening in the brain while that kind of thing is taking place. So one important idea that Vikram also touched on is that we have these internal mental representations for things like speech sounds. And one of our jobs when we're a baby is to sort out what parts of those mental representations are useful and what aren't. Um, so here is, oh, no, we're not doing that again. There we go. Uh, so here's an example of what I mean. If you're a baby acquiring any language, one thing you have to do is learn all the speech sounds in that language and how to produce them. And that could mean learning a whole bunch of features, stay with me here, like this. Um, this is called a feature geometry. And researchers in this kind of domain really talk about every single speech sound having a lot of these different features specified. And there are things like where to put your tongue in order to make a sound and when to switch on your larynx in order to make your voice or whether to round your lips or not, or whether to stop the airflow or not, and lots of other things too. And of course, you don't just figure that out once. You have to do it lots of times because you've got lots of speech sounds, right? So that's a lot of information that has to be represented. And doing that for every single speech sound in any language is a lot of information that makes it tough for the brain to manage, especially for something as fast as speech. So we know that having those highly specified representations for every sound would be just too cumbersome. And so the idea is that as we use words in different contexts and our utterances get longer and more complex, a process of typical development has to be under specifying all of that information. So we start off with these very highly specified kinds of mental representations, and then we figure out which parts of that feature list are relevant for our particular language and which ones aren't. So suppose this baby is learning English, and they need to know that to produce a p sound, just p, um, they don't actually need all of that information, just these parts of it. Um, so for English, those other features don't really matter so much. In some languages, they do matter, and that's why they're in the tree in the first place, because you don't know beforehand which language you're going to have to acquire. Um, so in Hindi, for example, you have to specify whether that sound is aspirated or not. So you'd have to add that feature back in again. But in English, you can safely ignore that. And you can easily see how this process of under specification um, really means that the mental representations, the internal representations, the speech sound processing are much simpler. 
So the idea would be that if these two babies, right, both of them are using highly specified representations for their practice speech, and they need them so they can figure out which specific features are important for the language that they're acquiring. And then as they grow up, suppose our speaker on the right here is developing typically with respect to this skill. But then suppose for our speaker on the left, um, maybe this process of underspecification actually fails. Like maybe they didn't manage to underspecify their speech sound representations. And so they're dealing with all of this kind of complexity. And that would probably lead to errors when they have to handle a complex speech environment. So my background as a speech language pathologist came in handy here. And I investigated this phenomenon called apraxia of speech, a kind of speech disorder characterized by inconsistency. So when a child has this disorder and they try to say a word, if they get it wrong and then try again, they'll make a different mistake the next time and then try again and make a different error, right? So it's very inconsistent. Sometimes they get further and further from the target. So we asked the question, could that be something that happens when this underspecification process fails? So to evaluate this, we looked at the brains of children um, and how they respond when they hear speech sounds from their own language system and compared that to closely related speech sounds that don't exist in their own language system. And in fact, we use that speech sound p. So remember that in English, we don't make a distinction between the p sound and the aspirated version p. So if you're an English speaker like me, it's actually quite hard to do that and tell them apart, right? So we'll try again. So it's p versus p, right? So a bit more of a puff on that aspirated version. So when we go through this underspecification process, we can afford to underspecify those two variants of the p sound. And we can predict that the brains of children who are acquiring English should respond the same way to both of those sounds. They shouldn't make a difference between them. But if children with this speech disorder have overspecified speech sound representations, then what we might see is that they continue to make that distinction at the level of the brain. So here's how we did it. We recorded brain activity using these, um, these arrays of electrodes that you can see here. Um, this is called EEG, and they allow us to tell how the brain is responding to stimuli thousands of times per second. We played lots of utterances of these p and p sounds, and we compared the signature brain responses to all those sounds for children with and without this speech disorder. And we found some decent evidence um, that children with apraxia do, in fact, overspecify speech sounds. So this is the typically developing comparison group, and you can see how the brain activation to the p sound and the p sound, right, the blue and red, respectively, they're more or less the same over time. But for children with this speech disorder, you can see that there's a big difference. And that really um, suggests that um, there's something about the nature of those internal representations that we build up as we're practicing speech. But as we practice, we're also changing our internal representations, changing those templates and using them to inform our continuing productions. If we don't change those representations, maybe because of a disorder or maybe because, you know, we're just too old when we start practicing, like when we try to acquire a second language as adults, then maybe we'll never be able to process speech efficiently enough or quite like a native speaker of that language. Okay, I'm going to segue into reading. Reading is a skill that also relies on our mental representations of speech and language, and it adds another layer of practice too. We need visual expertise, visual practice to be able to do reading. So like speech, reading needs to be over-practiced and overlearned to get us to that um, level of efficiency that we really need to support effective comprehension. So here we did another EEG study, this time with adults. And we were looking for this brain signature of automatic reading that's been shown by other researchers to indicate that kind of really fast, efficient recognition of written words, kind of parallel to the speed and efficiency that we have to develop for the recognition of speech sounds. And we compared brain responses in adults who learn to read as children with adults who learn to read later in life. We asked them to do a one back task, which is this task here. All you have to do is just figure out if the slide before was the same. Right, So just one back, press a button if it's the same. And so this is a great task because you can do that even without being able to read, right? You, all you have to do is know that there's a match. But the interesting thing is that if you're an expert reader, then you'll read anyway. If they're words, then you're gonna read them no matter what, you can't help it. Um, so we presented words in the speaker's native languages, in the reader's native languages, and also some symbols just to, give them something that couldn't be read, no matter how good they were. 
Um, and this is what we found for the people who had learned to read as children. So what you can see here is that, um, first of all, there's pretty well-organized brain activity, right? It's all in this kind of middle range. This is like a very kind of calm and organized brain response. But you can also see over the left hemisphere here, this is a deeper kind of activation. And that's that signature of expertise that we were looking for. So when these people saw words compared to symbols, you got that greater activation in the visual word form area that's part of the left hemisphere of the brain. But then for the participants who didn't learn to read as children, and they actually had done very well, they passed their literacy exams, they passed their tests, they could do this task. But you can see, first of all, that their brains are working much harder. And then you can also see that they don't show that signature of expertise with respect to the, the written words, that they really are processing symbols and words in a very similar way. So this has lots of implications. It means that we have to address literacy effectively and as early in development as possible. And it means that for adults who didn't get the chance to learn to read as children, we know they can't access written language the same way as those of us who were lucky enough to get that opportunity earlier. So we have to consider what that means for education worldwide um, and for issues around how literacy is taught and issues around reading disorders too. And I've done some work on all of those issues, and some of my collaborators are here today. It's very nice to see you, um, but I'm running out of time. And so I want to end by telling you about a project that we're working on right this minute, a very timely project, we think, um, that is looking at the differences in brain responses when children read via digital and print media. And so we're all concerned about that, right? Um, classrooms are moving more and more to digital media, but we actually don't know yet because the research is still needed how that might affect comprehension or retention or other aspects of reading attainment. And this is really crucial because it's the age when practicing this skill really matters and can really make a difference. So again, using our EEG technology, we've been bringing 10 to 12 year old middle schoolers into the lab and we're asking them to read short passages either from a page or a screen. Um, and then we ask them to rate a series of written words on the computer for how closely related those words are to the passage they just read. And we're hypothesizing that if they engage in deep processing of a text, then the semantic networks they set up are going to be richer and more robust and shallower processing will result in more flimsy meaning representations. And then we can see that difference at the level of the brain. So here's an example. We have a passage about Coco the gorilla. And our participants read that and then we show them a bunch of words and we ask them to press one button if they think the word is related and another if they think it's not. We don't really mind about the button presses though because we're interested in how the brain is sorting out this information and it goes a lot faster. So here we have some words that are closely related to this passage. And then we have some words that are not related at all to this passage. So your brains just gave us different responses. And then we have some words that are kind of in the middle, sort of related, sort of not. And so if your semantic network is rich and strong and vibrant, then your brain might classify those in between words as related to what you just read. And if your semantic network is a bit less well established, then maybe your brain is determining that those in between words are not related to what you just read. Do you see what I mean? So here's what we have so far. And these are just preliminary data. There we are. Um, so here the green lines are showing us how the children's brains respond to those related words. The red lines are the unrelated words and the blue lines are the in-between words. And this is when they saw a digital passage. And so you can see here that the responses to the in-between words are going with the unrelated words. And then here, um, when they read from a, a written, a printed passage, you can see that the responses to those in-between words actually pattern with the related words. And so our data really suggests, it's preliminary, but it's suggestive that when children are reading from a printed passage, they're setting up these stronger networks and those in-between words are kind of patterning with closely related words. And a digital format is showing something more like a, a flimsier, sort of less well-established semantic network. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a place for ease of reading, rapid information processing, and therefore potentially shallower processing. Um, that also has a place in instructional contexts, along with that you know, deep learning, deeper processing too. And we have yet to determine as well how these differences might be related to other factors like general reading or language skill, how it might affect things like information retention. So this really is work in progress. I have to thank our generous funders for that. 
and please watch this space. My time is more than up. I know I'm watching the panic build up on the faces of the people in the front row. So I'm going to hand it back over, um, but I just want to end with a few quick points. Um, I want to remind you that the linguistic environment is intricately structured in ways that we're only just beginning to understand. Opportunities for practice in listening and producing language have to happen at the right time in development. Otherwise, maybe we can't tap into those brain mechanisms. And what we see in behavior, like passing exams or doing well on some task, might actually miss what's happening at the level of the brain. And if we can look at brain activation, then maybe we can reveal some of those challenges and problems that language learners or readers have become very good at concealing or compensating for. So like songbirds, humans rely on practice and feedback and repetition in order to become good at this stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, I will now invite Karen and Vikram to join me uh, on stage for a discussion where we will answer some of your questions. Okay, I have like 100 questions, but I will start off easy. So in relation to the finches, um, can the song be modified? This was a big question among the teacher scholars, at least at my table. So let's say the male finch or the 2T learns a song from the dad and they hear like a competing song that sounds way better. Are they like, okay, I have to compete with this song. I will fix it. Or does the dad fix it? Is it fixable? Yeah, that's a that's like yeah that, that that question itself is I think like hundred questions in one. <laughs> but, so i you know I can spend like the whole evening talking about that, but I'll keep it brief. Um, so so there's a, so there's a critical period, right, in which in which they need to hear the the father song. So within that critical period, people have found that you can actually teach them one song, and then you can you can get them to switch to a different song. Uh, but it has to be within that period. Once that critical window closes, then, then it's fixed. But that's for zebra finches. There are other songbirds that continue to learn different songs throughout their lives. And you know, there are all kinds of different songbirds. But for zebra finches, there's that window, and that's it. And that's it. Yeah. Okay. Which parallels speech and language a, a lot, too. Sorry, I'm supposed to turn on my microphone if I talk. It parallels speech and language. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> Um, and um, Vikram, um, when we were talking about this, you actually told me that great story about when um, the songs that are played to uh, the birds in their critical period are distorted and they don't ever acquire the right song, but then over generations, they gradually fix it for themselves. Yeah, right? yeah. so that's, yeah, so that, I mean, I, I guess I should, that's that's like my coolest, <laughs> like the coolest experiment ever. It's very cool. Uh, it's very cool. I, I didn't do this, so <laughs> I can I can say this uh, unbiasedly. Uh, it was actually done by a person called Ofer in uh, when he was at Hunter College in New York, and it's like the coolest experiment uh, ever. So what he did was he took, he took a zebra finch uh, and he never allowed the father the father never met the son, right? So the son never had a model to copy. So he grew up without a model. And so he, you know, he made the best he could. So he came up with a song. It was, you know, it was not a very good song. It was, uh, it was, it was not very zebra finchy. It, was, it, sounded, <laughs> it sounded weird, but, you know, he did his best. And when he grew up, you know, he saw a female and he readily sang to her. That was his song. So he sang to her and the female didn't have a choice. And so she accepted him. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and so they had a, they had children. And so he happily tutored his son with, with this crappy song. Right. And, and the son, that's all he had. So he tried to make a copy of this, this song and he did his best oh, and, you know, and he had his son and so on. So, and so he did this for like five generations. And after five generations, the song fixed itself. So it was back to zebra finchy, normal sounding song. And Karen can tell you more, but I think there are parallels in, in human language oh. development when you have populations that are uh, Yeah, isolated. populations that are together that don't speak the same language. And how, you know, at first, those two populations will find ways to communicate with one another. And we call that a pigeon. And it's a... a 
communication system that doesn't have the typical structural properties of a language. It doesn't really have the right syntax. Uh, the phonology gets a little kind of confused. The sound system of the language gets messed up. But over generations, when the, the, the speakers of the pidgin have children, those children will like impose the linguistic structures on the input that they're getting. And so it's very suggestive about what we bring to the language learning situation, that as, as any species, you're bringing internal structures to the learning task that's ahead of you. As humans, we bring knowledge about the possible internal structures of language to that learning situation. And then we take whatever input we can get and we will make it approximate to the structures of a human language, even if that's missing from the input. Yeah, within the critical period. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you guys have answered a few of my questions. <laughs> I don't, don't want to hog the time. Okay. So I'm, I'm also monitoring questions that come online. So I have a general question here for both of you. Um, in your presentations, you've told us about how birds learn songs and how humans learn how to speak. And um, the question is uh, um, whether there is some similarity uh, in these processes at all, in these two forms of learning, or whether they are really radically different. I think we've been talking about that a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think when Vikram and I first met, we weren't sure that there would be quite so much um, contact between our two disciplines. But no, there are a lot of parallels, um, as we've been discussing tonight, the fact that Practice relates to internal templates. That's something that we know to be true for both learning situations. Um, the existence of critical periods, um, the ways that we process input creatively with respect to structural properties of the language, um, the ways that we structure the practice environment for our, you know, our offspring or for the younger generation. Um, there are parallels there too. What am I missing? There's more. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think I think you covered it. I, I'll just say that uh, also, you know, obviously, you know, the zebra finch learns one song and he just sings that one song, very simple, you know, A, B, C, D for the rest of his life, right? And we obviously, it's much more complex and there's all kinds of things we do. But again, the zebra finch in, in some ways is the simplest of the songbirds, right? And that's why we study it because, you know, we don't want to study very complicated things. We want to get traction, right? But there are all kinds of different songbirds. Yeah. So for example, the next level of complexity, it's called a Bengalese finch. And there, the Bengalese finch can change the syllable order. So the Bengalese finch can go A, 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 B, 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 C, C, A, A, B, C, D, B, B, C, C. They can change the sequence. And so, and there are more and more complex songbirds. You, at the other end of the spectrum, you have birds like nightingales that literally have hundreds of songs in their repertoires and they can pick and choose which songs to sing at what time. And so in some ways it's like, you know, once we understand the zebra finch a little bit, maybe we can go further and further, maybe closer and closer to human complexity level of complexity. Humans, yeah. Also, um, how big is a zebra finch brain? It's like a, yeah. a like a like a centimeter like, like, a, a, centimeter. like a sugar cube like yeah. a sugar cube yeah. Huh? Yeah. and human brains are bigger yeah. and have lots of folds <laughs> and yeah yeah so complexity you, you you would think not that you know size doesn't really matter but <laughs> <laughs> but the complexity that's available to us is you know astronomical um, and creativity in song I think is uh, something very interesting to hear about from the perspective of songbird research, because creativity in language is something that we, we think about a lot too. Um, so there are definitely parallels. Yeah. Right, right. Any? Question here. Uh, first, thank you very much for your uh, talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question about the, the EEG. Uh, can you follow the uh, RPE, so reward prediction error with uh, EEG? And if yes, did you observe uh, the reward prediction error that uh, we saw in uh, Zebra Finch? And if yes, uh, did you observe it in a uh, uh, subject with patient with apraxia of speech? I'm so sorry. I wasn't able to hear that very well. So did, oh. did you see these prediction error signals? Oh, AG, okay. So, AG. Sorry, do you hear me like that? Um, I can re repeat if you prefer. 
It's okay. I think I got it. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so did we see prediction errors in the people with apraxia of speech? Um, that's, as far as I know, that's not work that's been done. That's not what we were looking for. Um, that we were looking to see, because apraxia of speech has been characterized over the years as a problem with motor speech planning, right? So people think it's a problem with actually putting the sounds together and moving your articulators the right way. And so we were very interested to understand if that was actually because of a problem with the motor programming or whether it was because of the internal mental representations, right? And so we were trying to identify something that could be considered some sort of causal mechanism. What we did was actually controversial. I don't want to bore you with the details, but but to then tell, you know, the speech pathology community that maybe they weren't right in their thinking about this all along, like it, it did cause a bit of a ruckus. Um, and so that was really kind of where we were targeting was how do people with a speech production problem perceive speech, right? So we were having them listen to speech. What you're talking about would be somebody, an experiment parallel to yours, where somebody is trying to produce a target speech sound and is failing to do so, and then observing the brain responses to that. And I think that would be a fabulous experiment to do, but it's not the experiment that we did. Okay, yeah. I thought about that because you said that the patient um, do some different error each time. So maybe mm. there's some feedback saying that the previous error was yeah, it's the, it's the characteristic like signature, the, the diagnostic feature that makes it, you know, something like apraxia of speech is that lack of consistency in the errors. So if you just have a motor programming problem with like one set of speech sounds, that would be something like dysarthria. Maybe your lips don't close so well or something like that. And you have like a, a, a strength problem or something that would be like a dysarthria of speech, a different diagnosis. And you can see how then you would treat that in a different way. Um, so it had implications for the interventions as well, just really trying to understand what's the underlying mechanism contributing to this kind of presentation. Yeah. So there is there, there was this other study that I think is, is related to this. It's not about language, but it's about music again. So when we found these results, we later came across this other paper, and this was in humans. So this was an EEG study in uh, piano players. And so what they did is they had headphones on the piano players and, you know, they would play the piano while the EEG was being recorded and they would introduce errors yeah. into the headphones exactly cool. like we did for the birds. Very cool. And they found these EEG prediction error sort of signatures. And the really cool thing was they found differences in how experts and novices brains responded to those errors. You know, so if you're, yeah. Where if you're still practicing, so if you're a novice and you're practicing, then you have like a big response to it. But an expert, so just think, like yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Again, like this that. wasn't my study, but I think I think broadly it was like yeah, if you're a novice and you get uh, different feedback, you probably think that you made the mistake. Right, right. But if you're an expert, you're like no, no way, no way I made that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and so your brain responds differently. But then you know we're expert talkers, so yeah. I wonder how that would actually play out in speech. It would be such an interesting thing to do. Yeah. A great question. Thank you. So we have several people online asking about the role of age in language learning. And I guess we could extend that also to the role of, of age in song learning for, for songbirds. Well, it relates to the critical period we've been talking about, right? There's a, there's a lot of research over many, many years really showing that um, there are different kinds of critical periods during development, um, not just for speech and language, for all kinds of things, for, you know, developing um, certain kinds of visual processes, motor skills, all kinds of things. Um, and there are certain kind of windows of time beyond which the access that you have to those internal representations seems to fundamentally change. It doesn't really go away, but it becomes much, much harder to shift your internal mental template um, once it's set and you get to a, a certain stage in development. So that's why, for instance, I've lived in America for 20 some years and I still sound like this, right? Because my internal phonology templates, the templates for the speech sounds I use in my language were set and fixed a long time before I came here. Um, and even though I can shift them around a little bit, I can, you know, I can adapt, I can make some conscious changes. Still, when I speak to my mom on the phone, 
I, you know, I slip right back. And so, so it's like that, that those internal representations are only available to us for a certain period of time. Um, and then the access gets much, much harder, which is why it's much tougher to acquire something complex like a, a second language right. um, as an adult. Right. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that happens, maybe it happens in humans too, is in songbirds. So if you, if you don't give them a model, right, if you, then the critical period can actually extend a little bit. Mm. So it's like the brain is waiting to get that model but the moment it gets that model it's like okay i got the model now got i can it. close the yeah. window and just practice pretty so tough happens, to do those experiments in humans <laughs> yeah yeah i think about ways i mean we do have situations like you know the so-called wild children i mean i don't really love that term but people who have experienced extraordinary deprivation during development and really don't get access to those kinds of input that they need um genie might be the most famous case but that there are many um, at different um, periods of, of history too. Um, and Jeannie certainly never acquired language, right? She was able to learn some words and use them to communicate. The language is a complex system with an internal structure and she wasn't able to acquire those aspects of it. So yeah, I don't know about extending the period, but we, we do know that you know there are aspects of language yeah. knowledge that just stop being available at a certain point. Yeah. Um, thank you. This is awesome. Um, I know you mentioned a lot about like the essentials of a male bars learning the song in order for mating purposes, but is there any information on maybe mother daughter? And if the father's not around, uh, is the mother able to help the son? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah, so, yeah. So, so those are, again, I think there were like 10 questions in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. I'll say, I'll say, I'll say a few things. So, so yeah, I almost exclu exclusively talked about the males, right. And, and I did not talk about the females at all, which is very wrong, right. I should, uh, I should uh, so, and, and in fact, you know, in, in neuroscience as well, people have mostly focused on, on male animals and the females have sort of been neglected, including in songbird research. So one of the new directions we are starting in the lab is looking at the female. Because, you know, the male goes through all this effort to learn the song. And the only reason he's really doing all this is so he can attract the female, right? And the female doesn't sing in, the, in this species, but she needs to listen to the song and evaluate the song and figure out if it's an attractive song or not and decide whether she's going to mate with this guy and, and you know, marry him, right? Uh, and these, are, these birds are... <laughs> These birds are socially monogamous. So, so this decision to pair up with him or not is, is one of the most important decisions she'll make, but we have no idea how she's doing it. And so it turns out that the females also have a song system like the male, even though it's smaller, which makes sense because they don't actually sing, but they do have a small version of the song system. And so one hypothesis is that the males and females song systems have co-evolved for production of the song on the male side and sort of evaluation and showing a preference on the female side. And so we are testing these hypotheses in the lab. Thank you. Me, yeah. uh, hi, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really fascinating. Uh, I'm, I'm curious still about, the, about people who are trying to learn a second language. Um, we've spoken a lot about internal structures and the critical period. I'm wondering also maybe about our students who are trying to, to learn second languages. Are they having to overcome like a cognitive dissonance where they're getting dopamine, you know, deficits because they're pronouncing it wrong in their original language? And, you know, would it be easier maybe to teach a new language with an accent, you know, that, that mimics their, their home language mm -hmm. accent or something like that? I'm, I'm curious if, if you know anything about that. Wow. <laughs> so, so, so many ideas for experiments in this room. <laughs> um, so, would it be easier to teach them a language with an accent that's like theirs? I think it would be very hard for somebody to um, be able to do that, right? To, you know, to get that accent and provide input with that sound system. But I understand what you're saying. I think what you're trying to say is, well, look, if learning the syntax is so hard, then maybe let's, let's not worry about the phonology, right? Let's use the same sounds that they use and just, you know, focus on the structures or something like that and thinking about ways to simplify the language learning task. I can say that the best kind of language input 
for acquiring a language is native speaker-like input, just rich linguistic input that is structured like native speakers use that input. And that most children, especially, will be able to use that input. It might take them a while to sort things out, to organize their own language system and figure out, you know, what's from a different language system. But most children will be able to work with that kind of input. What you don't want is situations where, for example, people who are not native speakers of a language trying to speak in that language to encourage their child to, you know, acquire it. Because then what the child is going to get is not native speaker-like input. It doesn't have that kind of um, depth and richness and consistency of structure that they need to kind of do the, the statistical learning. Um, for the rest of us beyond sort of childhood, when those kind of critical periods closed, yeah, for sure. There are things like interference from your L1. Um, I mean, uh, you know, my accent is an example of that, if you like, that I'm aware I don't sound American, but there's very little I can really do about it. Um, uh, but there are also examples of interference from um, other aspects of language, not just the speech sounds that you use, but the words that you use. Anybody here who's tried to, you know, speak in two languages knows that sometimes you can get the word in one of them, not the other. And, you know, sometimes you have to say the word in one language in order to get to the one in the language that you want and those kinds of instances. So we call that lexical interference. And there's also syntactic interference where you'll use a grammatical structure from one language, um, but produce the utterance in another language. Um, so like if you're a native speaker of French and you say, I came in through the door red today, right? And like you put the adjective after the noun, that's a very simple kind of example. Um, so we definitely do get those kinds of interference. We also get support from knowing one language, right? That if you already developed and acquired one language, then you have like a knowledge base that you can use to then help you acquire another one. So it's kind of a, yeah, it's it's all about um, balance. And certainly for our learners in schools who are struggling with the language system that, you know, now they have to be educated, they have to pass exams in a language that, you know, they don't speak at home and that they never got used to. I think the best thing to do is just to offer rich, immersion experience in that language and give them time to sort of work it out. Yeah. So <clears throat> I have a, a question here online for Vikram. Um, how might the role of dopamine change during practice if you don't get constant positive or negative reinforcement? If, if, you, if you don't get the... Yeah, I mean, that, I, that's going to severely impair... impair. So, you, so the, people have done experiments where you can you can sort of kill off the, the dopamine neurons that are projecting to the to the basal ganglia. And so then whether the bird makes a mistake or not, there's no dopamine input and then they're not able to learn as well. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. Um, you can also you can also use, uh, you know, you must have heard of this technology called optogenetics, right? It's like all the rage in neuroscience now where you can use light to turn on and off neurons. Uh, so you can use optogenetics to activate these dopamine neurons in, in a pitch contingent manner. So what, what do I mean by that? So, you know, every time the bird sings a certain syllable, he sings it at a certain pitch, right? But because every time he sings it, he sings it slightly differently, there's like a distribution of pitches, right? And what you can do is you can put a threshold on that pitch and you can say, whenever the bird sings above this threshold, I'm going to activate these dopamine neurons. And whenever the bird sings below that threshold, I'm going to not activate it. Right? So you're artificially reinforcing the high pitch. So if you do that, the birds actually learn to modify the pitch of their syllables and raise the pitch up. So this is sort of directly showing that you know, the hypothesis that dopamine is reinforcing actually works. Right. Thank you. I think we had a question. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, I hope this makes sense. I think you explained it very well. So um, were there different or were there or could there be different levels of dopamine response for some songbirds who did well during practice, meaning that the suppression of dopamine for an error actually hurt them worse? Does that make sense, that question? Could you say that last part again? Like, could 
for some songbirds, could the suppression of dopamine for an error hurt them worse? Could there have been different levels of dopamine response like when they got the song correct? Hmm? Like individual differences? Like yes. some learners are more motivated yes. and some are just right. better. Right, right. Meaning, like, if that were true, would or did you see the frequency of practice increase more in some birds based on different levels of dopamine response? That's a great question. Yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Uh, we haven't we haven't looked at that. Uh <laughs> I mean, you know, these are these are these are pretty hard experiments to do. Yeah, uh, but, but that's a great question, and I mean, there are certainly differences in how fast different birds are able to learn. Like, we can actually teach different birds the exact same song now. Like, we don't even need the father. We can actually use like playbacks to to you know to <laughs> to them the song we want. So you could take like ten you know, 10 baby zebra finches and teach them the exact same song, they're not all going to learn the song in the same rate. There are different rates, right? Some are fast learners, some are slow learners, some are maybe more accurate, but slower. And what is causing these differences? Is it because of dopamine? Are there other differences? These are all great questions and I don't know the answer to any of these. Things. <laughs> but but they're, they're great experiments to do. Thank you. There's another question. Here, yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, awesome, by the way. <laughs> I'm like, I feel like I'm at this level and you guys are like, just bringing me up. So very cool. <laughs> um, so I have a two part question based on the last couple of questions. So can you like with this new science, can you like create like a super finch? Like, <laughs> you know, like it's like, Ma like man of a finch that just gets all the lady finches from like teaching him the best songs that's part one and part two um just from like a a kind of teacher perspective um we scaffold things in the classroom you know for students and we break things up um for vikram do you see that in the finch world do do, do the dads ever like break up the songs and for language um it just came into my head because my brother has a, a four month old and I watch a lot of Seinfeld. Um, <laughs> but like when you talk like baby talk, like, like, Oh, like, is, is that really like, because you want to immerse them in like something that's, that's like, you know, that has depth. So do you, is that helpful or is that just like a learned behavior that we, just keep on doing that's just ridiculous um because i bet they're not doing that with the finches but yeah so hopefully yeah yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. so fantastic question yeah and uh, and okay so the first question so we are actually trying to i don't know we're not we're not trying to use optogenetics on on the males but by studying the females we are trying to figure out if if we can make like a like a super attractive song yeah. you know like like you know almost like a super normal stimulus which is like more attractive than normal songs like what are the features of song that the females like really care about so one of them is stereotypy which we know because you know them but there might be other features and so we are trying to figure out what exactly the females like and the second part of your uh, question actually zebra finches do do that so so you know how you were talking about like mother east or whatever like yeah. so zebra finches use some version of father east uh, <laughs> and there's yeah there was one of my colleagues uh, looked at this recently and so when the father finch sings to the baby he doesn't sing in exactly the same way that he sings when he's practicing or when he's singing to his mate mm. and uh, so so he analyzed the features and he claims that the the features actually are in line with what human mothers do when they speak to their babies. So, so maybe it is like a, maybe it is a useful thing to do. Uh, what do you think? It is a useful thing to do, yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, yeah, uh, another Google parallel. Minds. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, mother ease is hugely important and in ways that we really are only just beginning to understand. Um, we, we're not just doing baby talk, right? It's not gaga -ga goo goo kind of things. It's uh, It has many different dimensions. We systematically simplify the kinds of structures that a child happens to be trying to acquire at that time. We change our pitch, we change our speech rate, and we do it all so that 
the processing of that particular structure is optimized and we do it without conscious awareness that that's what we're doing. I mean, it's an extraordinary, intricate, reciprocal structuring of the linguistic environment. Um, and we're really only just beginning to understand really what happens. And it's data like the data I played you that is allowing that kind of investigation. Like that's what we need is to be able to study what's happening between parents and children in a specific context over years. Right? But then how do you study that? Like there's, it's, it's very, very difficult to kind of access. So models like what you're talking about are going to be very important for that. Um, but also this kind of, you know, systematic investigation of the ways that we uh, simplify the structures and then build them back up again incrementally. Like that's that's the kind of structure that we're we're offering all the time. So Mother Ease is awesome, mind blowing, amazing. Keep it up. <laughs> Do more. Yeah. Thank you. You guys are so cool. <laughs> we we're almost out of time, but very briefly, there is one final question for the both of you. Um, can this line of research produce insights into practice and learning in daily life, such as learning and practicing new languages or new instruments? Very briefly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that briefly. <laughs> I mean, for sure, right? This, um, what it's helping us do is understand the mechanisms that underpin learning. And so I happen to focus on language, which is a kind of special case of learning. But there are many, many domains where this is applicable. Um, and many people in the room tonight are educators. Uh, and so we know that directly affects us and the people that we work for and the communities that we serve, um, that if we can understand better what those mechanisms are, then we can address problems more effectively when they arise. We can identify issues earlier in development and stand a better chance of helping and supporting. Um, and we can be more effective at our jobs, right? And as educators, that's what we want. We're working for the learning and success of others uh, and the benefit of the community. So understanding how to do that, I think, yeah, that's the, the crucial thing. So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm not an educator at yes, all. You are, you're right here. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but uh, so here's my, it's a professor. my <laughs> I know, but I, I actually don't teach that much. But, <laughs> but uh, so take everything I'm saying with like a huge grain of salt. Uh, but here's my two cents. So I think one is I think feedback obviously is very important, but also I think that the timing of the feedback is very important. Yeah. So if you give feedback like much later, it might not be very useful. You need to give it like, you know, at the right time. Uh, that's one sort of general principle, I think. And the second, I think uh, this is sort of more from my own sort of life experience and stuff. You know, we learn so many things by trial and error, but the problem is that when we make a mistake, there is like an error. Yeah, we, 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 we know we made a mistake, but there's also this sort of massive, like emotional sort of valence, right? Like we get like sad and, you know, we get upset, you know, we get rejected and we get like really sad and that prevents us from trying again. So when you're teaching children, students to do things, somehow we need to make them realize that it's okay to make mistakes, to receive the feedback without you know feeling devastated so that they're willing to try again and i think that's my two cents thank you this is all the time we have but thank you all for attending this event and thanks again to both our speakers for joining us today um and for those joining us virtually yes this, this time. <laughs> For those, of, for those of you joining us virtually, please take two minutes to fill out the survey, uh, which will be put in the chat, and let us know what you thought about tonight's events. We really appreciate any feedback. Thank you. I think this is a final remark from Diana. Oh, please clap for me as I come back. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much to Vikram, Karen, and Raphael for these amazing talks and for a really stimulating discussion. And to all of you who submitted questions or asked them in person, you really make the event sing. 
or a talk, perhaps. <laughs> um, we hope you enjoyed this. And if you liked it, meet us same place, same time, different day. Wednesday, November 9th is our next set of lectures. And it'll feature Dr. Bianca Jones Marlin, as well as Dr. Yasmin Hurd. And they will be discussing epigenetics through development, learning, and addiction. And how the interplay of nature and nurture in one generation can impact the brains in the future generations. So I hope you all continue to stay healthy and stay well. And I wish you all good night.